Hello. Our tragedy continues inside the Jedi Temple on Coruscant. Luna woke up to the sound of clone troopers clearing and sweeping the area. Luna rubbed her cheeks. They were dry from the tears of the night before. Luna saw a small glimmer of light from a hole in the small cocoon that she was trapped under. She could tell that it was daytime, so she ever so peacefully and carefully used the force to lift the pillar over her head to the side so she could crawl out. When she did, she stretched her legs for the first time in more than 10 hours. She looked around. She didn't see a soul. Luna grabbed her thigh where she was clipped the night before. It hurt terribly, but she could at least walk on it. Luna walked through the hall of the temple. It used to be so beautiful. She looked up at the pillars covered in blaster marks and looked down at the carpets filled with bodies. Luna carried on towards the great hall of the Jedi Temple, keeping quiet and keeping her distance. Across the temple, there were little groups of clones, though it seemed like most of the 501st cleared out. Luna looked across the way and saw a small child get up and begin to limp across the walkway. Luna knew it would be too dangerous to try and engage with the youngling. If the child could survive, then she could continue to survive. It was now the survival of the fittest, and Luna couldn't look out for anyone other than herself. She heard the sound of some clone troopers and she got behind a pillar. The clones walked by and they stopped, asking if they heard something. The clones then saw the little girl walking across the walkway, and one of the men mentioned being able to secure another kill. Luna stepped out from behind the clones, and before even giving them a chance to notice she was there, she ignited her lightsaber and dragged it across the back of her knees. They both fell to the ground in astounding pain. Luna used the force to throw them to the ground with so much incredible force. She then walked forward, kicking the clone troopers over so she could see them. She was disgusted. They were her brothers. They were her friends and all they could do was this? Chalk up all the Jedi to just being killed? This wasn't who they were. The clones looked at the young Jedi. They weren't afraid so they spat on her. Luna clenched her fist with her lightsaber in her hand and threw the blade into one of the clone troopers. Her eyebrows creased. The other clone's sly confidence dissipated and he began to crawl away, trying to get somewhere, not being able to use his legs, with both of them having been cut the way they were. Luna pulled the clone with the force down the hallway with her. She didn't say a word, just dragging his face along the carpet. He tried to plead with her, telling her that it wasn't what she thought, but he was still trying to grab a weapon. The carpet burn across his face was excruciating. Luna stopped and pulled him with the force, throwing him against the pillar with so much force as she could, snapping several of his vertebrae. She knelt down in front of him, jabbing her blade into both of his elbows so that he couldn't do anything to fight back. The clone trooper sat there defenselessly. He just looked at her, total fear in his eyes. His face was red from the carpet burn. Luna put the lightsaber against the chest of his armor, allowing the heat to just burn through the plating. Luna tilted her head ever so slightly and watched the clone realize what she was doing. He shook his head. He tried to talk her out of it, but she pushed a little harder, cutting completely through the armor and slowly beginning to cut through the fabric underneath, burning his skin beneath that. The clone panicked and looked to both of his sides, looking for someone to save him. Luna just told the clone that no one would save him, just like no one saved all of her peers, all the little kids. As she drove the lightsaber a little further, pulling each cell of skin apart, slowly. The heat alone brought sweat down his face. The clone, too, panicked to yell for help, too concerned for anything, hoping that the Jedi would do what any Jedi would do and spare him. The clone trooper tried to make excuses for his actions, but Luna didn't care, pulling her blade away and slashing down to his arm, removing it and waiting just long enough for the shock to jolt him into a world of pain before swinging her lightsaber across his chest and killing him. Luna deignited her weapon. A tear slipped down her face. What had she done? Who had she become? Luna put her lightsaber on her belt and began walking through the temple. She was looking for a way out. It's obvious that the clones would guard the main entrance. From down the hallway, Luna heard the sound of blaster bolts. They began firing, and then the clones sat it off, as if they had just killed another Jedi. Luna ran forward and peered around the corner. She looked at the group of clones. They were standing over a couple of Jedi younglings. Luna recognized one of the Jedi. She knew her, and they just killed her. Luna couldn't stop herself. There were four clones, but she couldn't stop. She stepped around the corner, telling the clones that she would like to be taken in for questioning. The clones turned towards her. Luna just told them that she had information about other Jedi. She was going to give it over to them. The clones looked at each other, raising their blasters and walking forward, demanding Luna put her hands up. So she did. The clones got closer and closer, and when they were within 20 feet of her, she clenched forth her fist, and two pillars began to lose their ability to hold together, and the faces dropped out from under them. The clones looked up as they cried out and ran forward. Luna reached out with a grin on her face and pulled the pillars down faster. Three of the clones were instantly killed. One of them was still alive. His legs were crushed, and he couldn't reach his blaster. Luna climbed over the pillars and saw the clone trying to reach for his comlink, trying to reach out for help, so naturally, Luna reached 
her hands out. She felt so much power in this moment. The clone trooper began to choke as Luna looked at him. She stood over him, choking him until she heard his neck snap. Luna snapped back into reality and she ran over to the woman she recognized. It was hard not to recognize this Jedi. She was still one of the few who still wore High Republic garments. She was protecting the younglings. It looked like she saved a collection of younglings, but they were discovered before they could escape. Luna knelt down next to Natabre and gently moved her hair out of her face and closed her eyes. Luna got up and made her way for the exit. First, she would try the side of the temple. It would be a bit dangerous considering it would lead to the city of course on itself, but it was better than staying inside the temple. Luna was by herself. That was the simple truth. If she didn't look out exclusively for herself, then she would likely be killed by the clones too. Luna got to the edge of the temple and opened the door. She saw a small group of clones huddled up. They were clearly waiting for some of the Jedi to get back, so Luna would make their job a little harder. The clones since Order 66 seemed to be a little bit detached for whatever reason, which Luna found a bit weird. She ran across the side of the temple. The clones heard footsteps, and the six of them turned around towards her. Luna watched them raise their blasters, and so she lowered her leg and slid under them, using the force to throw them to their feet and off the side of the temple, to tumble down dozens of dozens of stories to their inevitable deaths. Luna grabbed her thigh again. She could feel the pain from the wound. She couldn't go back inside the temple to deal with it. She had to find another way to deal with it. As she lowered herself to the edge of the temple, using a grapple and wrapping it around a pillar, she used a grapple to repel down the side of the Jedi Temple and down into the city streets of Coruscant. She was still wearing her robes, and that would be proven to be an issue for her but right now she needed to stay hidden, and so that's what she was focused on doing. In the mid-rim, Luna's brother was walking through the city streets in the capital city of Boz Biddy. He was still so horrified. He didn't see any clones, and the last interaction with the clones he had was watching his brother be executed by B-1 battle droids. Titus was ducking through alleyways, keeping his eyes out. All he saw were battle droids and tanks. Though, there was one concerning issue. A Republic light cruiser just entered the atmosphere and was currently sitting just outside the city gates. With the recent behavior of the clones, it wouldn't be weird to assume that the clones or the Republic would just get more aggressive with their warfare techniques. Titus was really worried about his sister, and he was looking for a way to find her, or at least get to her in the hopes that she was still alive. Though he didn't know where to search, so he would go to the Jedi Temple first. It seemed like the best way to find out where to go. Not to mention, Titus got a message from Anakin Skywalker himself, one that was sent to every Jedi telling them that the war was over and it was time to return to the temple. It was kind of weird to assume that was the case, but Titus was happy to know that the temple stood. A message like that gave him hope that his little sister made it back to the temple. Maybe Master Kron and Luna made it out alive, but all Titus knew is that there was one safe haven in the galaxy, and that was the Jedi Temple. Titus found a spaceport, except it was shut down. No one was really allowed to enter or even leave it, though Titus didn't really care for the rules put in place by the enemy. So, he in turn used his Jedi weapon to cut through the door and get into the hangar area. Titus looked around at the numerous vessels inside the bay area, and there was only one ship that didn't have a gravity lock on it. The ship was a Razor Crest. It was a bit bulky for Titus, but it would do the job. So he entered the vessel. Titus looked around. The ship obviously belonged to a bounty hunter before. There was a large hat inside the ship, with an assortment of weapons. What a weird collection. Regardless, Titus looked around the entire vessel. He knew that Razor Crest had a tendency to fall apart and require a lot of repairs, and truthfully, he didn't want to have a breakdown while he was fleeing the Mid-Rim, between the Republic fleet above the planet and the possibility of running into the Separatists. He needed a ship that was functional. Titus got to the cockpit and checked the diagnostics. The ship was actually in pretty decent shape, which was surprising how dusty the interior was. Titus was trying to figure out why someone would just leave the ship behind, but he didn't want to mess around with it more than it already had been. He had to open up the hangar bay doors so that he could escape the planet. When he slid down the ladder to the main bay, he tripped over a loose panel and slammed into the wall, releasing a lock on the astromech. The droid fell over onto Titus's back, and landing on right where his shoulder was shot before. Titus rolled over and pushed the astromech off of him. It was an all-red droid, a C1 unit by the looks of it. Titus pushed the droid back against the wall, speaking aloud to himself, saying that he would mess around with the droid when he got into hyperspace. He left the Razor Crest after turning on the engines and went to the control panel for the hangar bay and pulled on the lever to open it. When he did, the doors creaked and croaked open. The Jedi Knight ran back to the Razor Crest and closed it up as he lifted off the surface of the planet into part of the system. When he got into space, he could see the Republic fleet, and it looked deathly still. There was an odd feeling about everything. There was a terrifying aura about the fleet, and Titus couldn't put his hand on it. Regardless, he pushed the ship into hyperspace and went back down into the cabin to investigate this droid that was covered in dust. When he got down the ladder, the droid was missing. Titus panicked for a hot sec because C1 series were known to be a bit bad with their tempers and use expletives towards living beings a lot. Titus looked around, lowering his stance and squaring his shoulders so that he could move the droid away from him if it moved on the attack. The sound of wheels 
turning towards him made him jump back, using the force to push the droid to the far side of the ship. The C-1 stopped and looked at him, waving one of his arms at him. Pettis told the droid he wasn't here to hurt it. He was a Jedi. He could be trusted. The droid wheeled forward just a little bit and changed its overzealous behavior. Pettis asked the droid what its name was. The droid beeped at him that his number code, which was given, was C-105T. Titus reached out his hand to touch the droid, saying to him that it was nice to meet him before he was shot. The shock sent Titus back into the wall. The Jedi Knight rolled his eyes and got back to his feet, using the force to lift the droid up into the air, holding him in mid-air. Titus told the droid that if the droid didn't stop acting like a hooligan, he would strap him to the engine compartment when they landed. The droid didn't take too kindly to this hostility, but in a way, it kind of worked. The C-1 series, even with its nasty behavior and temper, responded really well to sass, wit, and even a bit of hardcore sarcasm. Titus was prepared to put this droid into a whole new world of all of that. The droid beeped at Titus, cursing him out, and saying a number of incredibly aggressive things. Titus just looked at the droid and asked if he was done yet. The droid spun his head around. Titus told the droid that if he told him about everything that happened to the ship, maybe they could become friends. It was obvious the droid's owner had abandoned him. Tedis said he wouldn't abandon the droid if the droid was kind enough to be friendly. The expressive droid decided to negotiate his own terms of surrender, and so Titus let the droid down and then asked about the droid and everything there was to know. C1 told Titus that the name he was given was Lugnut, and it was given to him because of his stubbornness. Titus had a hard time figuring out where that stubbornness came from. The droid stopped and looked at the Jedi as Titus laughed, saying that he was joking and telling the droid to carry on. Lugnut told Titus that he was picked up from a scrapyard by a bounty hunter, but the bounty hunter truthfully was a wannabe Cad Bane, and that ended up costing him his life, especially when Cad Bane found out that said bounty hunter had a cooler hat than him, and felt the need to take that hat from the dead body. Cad Bane shut Lugnut off and deposited the ship to Boss Pity and received a hands one reward for it, and used the money to do whatever he wanted with it. Lugnut didn't have much data inside of his memory banks from before he was found by the bounty hunter. All he knew is that he worked on board a large starship from a number of years before, and the only reason Lugnut knew that is because one of the memories pre-scrap heap were inside the same ship, doing the same mundane tasks, acting like any other drone, which Lugnut was certainly not. Titus found the story to be a bit sad, but told the C1 droid that he would take care of him, as long as he allowed him to. Titus expressed that the Clone Wars were just over, and when they returned back to the Jedi Temple, everything would be safe. Though Lugnut had no clue what Titus was talking about, having been shut off for the last five years, Lugnut missed the entire build-up to the Clone Wars and the entire war in general, so Titus made an executive decision to tell the little droid about everything that had happened. On the planet of Coruscant, Luna was making her way through the city streets. Originally, it was all clear on the surface level, but as the day picked up, labels filled the streets, telling all citizens to report if Jedi had been seen. Luna knew she couldn't be found wearing Jedi clothes anymore, so she found a homeless woman around her size and asked her to switch. The homeless person wasn't sober, so it was an easy trade to make. Luna took the clothes from the woman and allowed her to have the robes of the Jedi. Because Jedi robes were made out of the best material, the homeless woman gave Luna her best pair of clothes, clothes that had been recently been clean. It was a great trade for the young Jedi. Luna watched shock troopers run through the streets, removing hoods from people. Luna knew that they would have a hard time knowing if she was a Jedi or not. She blended in with a lot of the population, and no clones would suspect her of being a Jedi. There was nothing stating the obvious about her. Citizens were being searched when they came to a certain checkpoint, which meant Luna couldn't just go anywhere on the planet. Her best option would be to go down to the lower levels. Clone troopers always went missing on lower levels, so once she got down there, she could take her pick of revenge on as many clones as she wanted. Luna's first day here after Order 66 was long already. As she kept going, a lightsaber activated and the sound of shock troopers could be heard. Luna looked across the way to see a young Twi'lek Jedi on the run. The face looked familiar, but Luna couldn't tell. She knew she had to take care of herself, but this was a child. The girl fighting back had no chance. Luna shook her head. She couldn't believe what she was doing. If she did this, she would break her cover, and it looked like that's what she was doing. Luna began running after the group, ducking below railings and avoiding being seen by camera droids that were filling the streets, to try and capture the sight of the Jedi, in case she avoided being captured or killed. Though the Jedi Padawan was skilled, she deflected shots back at the droids who were trying to capture her image. Though the shock troopers were highly skilled, one of them was cut down before the other five surrounded the Jedi, killing her, and then standing over her. Luna turned the corner and saw the youngling killed. 
The clone stood over her and fired more rounds into her dead body. Luna's body turned cold. She turned back and looked to see if there were any droids. She didn't see any, so she walked around the corner and slowly walked up behind the clones. They were confirming their kill of the youngling. Luna reached out with the force to pull the youngling's lightsaber to her hand. Only one of the clones noticed it and turned around. Luna spun forward through the air, commanding both lightsabers slashing at the clones. The only thing that could be known of the mutilation were the echoes and their cries bouncing out of the alleyway. Luna put both the lightsabers away, deciding to keep the lightsaber that former belonged to Twi'lek youngling Daisha Numa. Luna ran down the street and ducked into a small building to hide out. As she leaned against the wall, she slid down to the floor. She looked up at the sky above her. It was closer to midday by this point, and she had yet been able to get down to the lower city. Luna looked at the lightsabers. She could feel the crystals beginning to change, yet she didn't know why. As she sat on the ground, she felt chills run down her spine and throughout her body. When she breathed, she could see her breath in the air, but it wasn't cold outside. Coruscant was typically nice in terms of temperature. On the galactic temperature range, Coruscant was typically 21 degrees, or by outer rim scale, it was typically 70 degrees. This was because the city of Coruscant was located in such a high atmosphere that it typically would be really cold, but on top of that, the concrete jungle created a warmth to balance out the cool temperature, of course, especially when the sun was out. Luna wasn't cold, but she felt cold. It was much different of a feeling. It wasn't as simple as just being cold because of temperature. The force was reaching out to her belligerent behavior in the last 24 hours. Luna was becoming someone different. She was no longer the person she was before the purge. Luna sat herself down, holding her breath, trying to get a grip on what it is that she did to those clone troopers. It was horrific. It wasn't the Jedi way. But not even she knew what the Jedi way was anymore. Luna got a communication through her Jedi comlink. She looked at it. It was coming from the Jedi Temple. She hadn't seen this, but it was the same message her brother got, that the temple was safe and that it was time for all of them to return home. Luna bit her lip and grabbed the two lightsabers on her belt. She wanted to scream so badly, her eyes became bloodshot and she stood up like she was possessed. A duo of clones walked past her without acknowledging her, just assuming she was just one of the loony homeless people of the upper layer. Luna twitched her head and decided not to kill the clone troopers. It wouldn't do her much. Instead she would go deeper into the city and trying to find a way to get to the lower levels. Not far from where Luna was, a razor crest landed in an open spaceport. Out of it came Titus and Lugnut. Titus saw smoke emanating from the Jedi Temple, and he believed it would be better for him to find his way to the temple from the ground. As soon as Titus walked out from the hangar bay, he saw a sign, and reported that all Jedi were now criminals. Titus stopped in his tracks and asked Lugnut if the razor crest had any clothing in it. The droid called Titus an absurdity before letting him go back and grab a new outfit. Titus was a little taken aback by his attire. Firstly, it was baggy on him because the bounty hunter who had the ship for him was a bit larger than Titus, and secondly, he felt ridiculous without his Jedi robes. Titus packed a blaster pistol into his holster and put his lightsaber under his coat. The droid slammed into Titus as he walked out of the Razor Crest again. Titus asked what his problem was, as the droid continued forward going on a great tangent about this and that. Titus patted the droid on the head and turned the corner. From the street level, they could see smoke emanating from the Jedi Temple. All Titus could think about was where his sister was and if she was okay. While they were walking through the streets, Titus received a communication. It was a new one, though this one came from Anakin Skywalker's master. This was a bit weird. Titus told Lugnut to come into the alleyway with him. When he got there, he crouched down behind a couple of dumpsters and turned on the communicator. It started off with Obi-Wan addressing the situation. The Republic had fallen. It was time to stay away from the temple. The message was about to hit 30 seconds long, but by the end of its transmission, Titus put his head against the wall. Lugnut came around the corner and nudged the Jedi Knight. Titus turned over and put the communicator away and told the droid that it was all gone. Lugnut responded back to the Jedi inquisitively, trying to understand what this all meant. Titus told Lugnut that it was all gone, all of the hope. Titus had been holding out hope this entire time. Despite the fact that clones had turned on him, despite how ominous the message to return to the temple was, he believed that once he got here, everything would turn back to normal. Even after landing and seeing the Jedi Temple on fire, he still believed there was a chance that it was all a mistake, and now all of his hope was gone. Now it was real. The Jedi had been defeated, and they had to go into hiding. A small part of Titus wanted to go to the Jedi Temple to see if he could find Master Kenobi, considering the message just came through, but it would probably be a bad idea. Titus told Lugnut that they should go far away from Coruscant. It's likely this new empire that Kenobi referenced would begin to lock down everything on the city world, considering Kenobi mentioned something about this rising empire. It'd be a good idea to avoid said empire, in his mind. Titus took a deep breath and told the droid that it was time to move on from being a Jedi. Before Titus could leave, he heard the sound of a little girl. The voice called out from the alleyways she was in. He turned around and looked for what he was hoping to be his sister. It wasn't. It was a Jedi youngling. 
Tetis asked who it was before the girl told him that her name was Katuni. Katuni was noticeably limping. She had been very badly hurt. Titus ran over to her and asked what happened. Katuni stumbled over and fell to her knees. She had blaster marks on her thigh, arm, and one in the side of her stomach. Katuni started to cough as Titus caught her and kept her from hitting the ground. Katuni told him that it was awful, everything. The clones came in and they killed everyone. A chill ran down his back. Titus told Katuni that she could tell him everything later. She shook her head, telling him that if he was seen carrying her, then they would both be killed. Titus knew that, so he ripped open a bag of trash and emptied it and told her to get into it. She couldn't argue with that. It was actually a clever plan. So she climbed into it and he slung her over his shoulders and began walking through the city streets. They weren't too far away from the landing bay where they were parked, so the trio quickly got into the razor crest and entered it. When they got in, Titus told Lugnut to get the ship ready for launch. The droid beeped and bobbed and got up the ladder using the Baka booster on the bottom of him and got the bridge on and turned on the engines. Titus pulled out a small cot, putting Katuni down on it and grabbed some medical supplies for her. He used everything he could to patch her up. She told Titus that she was scared, but it wasn't because of this current moment. Katuni was living in the past. It wasn't her fault. The pain she was feeling put her back into the moment. She began to narrate it to Titus as it was happening. She didn't realize she was doing it either which was the most tragic part about it. Titus put a pod onto her shoulder and she passed out. While she was out, Titus patched her up before heading to the cockpit and prepared to depart for deep space. Titus trusted his Jedi training, and in the moment, that entailed trusting the Force. So, as soon as the ship was in hyperspace, he told Lugnut he wanted some time alone. The droid made him some noises and dropped down into the bay of the ship where Katuni was still sleeping. Titus closed his eyes and sat down on the floor, feeling the Force flow through his body. He became attached to the Force itself. He felt into his roots. He felt drawn to a place of tragedy, a planet where so much pain had already happened. It was nearby Mustafar. The planet of Earth, inside the Messina system, was where Titus was being drawn to. His home was calling to him, and so that's where he would go. Titus would take Katuni and Lugnut back home, though he knew there would be challenges. As far as Titus was aware, aside from the genocide during the Clone Wars, it would be clear there would be no empire there. When Titus got to the location he was looking for, he trusted the Force to guide him to the coordinates of the planet. This would suffice, hopefully. Until then, Titus went down and asked Katuni, who was waking up at this moment, about what had happened. She was very shaken, but she told Titus the night was just like any other night. She and her class were just finishing training before they went to bed. They were doing some of their basic Yuja tea practice, and the door was broken open and a bunch of clones ran in. Biff was the first one to be killed. The rest of them ignited their lightsabers and defended themselves when the clones barged in. Petro and Gungi took point, pushing the clones back, but there was more than just them. The clones piled in from around the corner. That was when Katuni was grazed across the side with a blaster shot. She was very badly hurt by it, but she, Ganudi, and Zat got out of the room. The minute they got out of the room, Petra was domed in the head. The four remaining students were horrified. That was when Katuni got hit in the thigh trying to escape. Ganodi was cut down by several blaster shots. Gungi ran forward trying to use a force and he threw the clones back. He was the physically strongest out of the bunch and he picked up Katuni. Zat was right with them as a trio made their escape. The temple was filled with terror. They saw Jedi Masters and Knights alike getting cornered and taken down like wild animals. Zat and Gungi used their lightsabers to defend themselves. Instead of looking for an easy way out of the temple, the three of them made their way to the Jedi Archives, where a large collection of the remaining fighters were. The Jedi Temple guards were blocking the doorways. When they got down there, the wall bursted open, and one of the clones shot Zat down and clipped Katuni in the shoulder. Gungi did everything he could to get her out of the temple. Through the lower exit level, which worked to perfection. That is until they ran into the clones, which a number of them were stationed around the temple, thanks to Skywalker's knowledge of the temple layout. When Gungi and Katuni got down there, out of the temple, they were escorted by a Jedi Knight, who was cut down by a number of clones too. And then, those clones chased the Wookiee Jedi. Gungi carried Katuni for as long as he could, until she became too heavy for him to carry, which is why she was left in the dumpsters. It was far away from where the clones would find her, and it ended up working. Though Katuni would remiss if she did didn't mention how afraid for her classmate she was. Katuni didn't know if Gungi survived. All she could do was hope that he had. Titus told her that he understood. His sister was somewhere in the galaxy too, but they had to listen to Master Kenobi. If anyone knew what to do, he did. When they arrived in the Messina system, Titus piloted the ship around the planet and felt called to go down towards a sea surrounded by a large amount of land. The ship sped around and Titus landed on a small island not far from a big piece jolting away from the continent. This despite the carnage looked like a sound place to set up camp, but when they landed, Titus noticed that the entire city was reduced to rubble. There was destruction everywhere, and there wasn't even a sight of a living being. It might be eerie, but there was something about this planet that made Titus feel and believe that they should be here. 
It's because the Force was strong with this planet, a certain balance that needed to be explored. Katuni was feeling much better and she was able to walk on her own at this point, but she had to use Lugnut for support. She followed Titus as he looked everywhere, remembering little bits and pieces of this town. The Force led him here because this was where he was born. Titus looked at a stone still standing, and the few structures that weren't completely erased by the DDT tanks. Titus told Katuni and Lugnut that they would stay here for their survival. It would be safe because the Empire was unaware of its existence. For the time being, that would prove them all the time they needed. On Coruscant, Luna was able to get down to level 1013, where she would have to make her own life. She knew that the crime liked to exist down here, and being as talented as she was, there should be no issue with her making enough credits to survive. Though something that sat in the back of Luna's mind was how much the dark side of the Force would influence her chances of survival. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is part six of our story. Again, special thanks to Galavan Gaming, Tristan, Darth Revan, Pimp Daddy Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Jedi Sloth, Mad Maddie Studios, Anakin 003, Lemon Knight, Rex the Wolf, The Man with Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, Flynn Van Seas, Jack Miller, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Smash that like button. It is heating up. We have returned to Earth. We took a little detour, but we are finally back home. My friends, I love you all, spread the love, and always remember, my friends, may the Force be with you.